Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I join the clergy to make a difference. For the most part, I'd like to think that's true. When someone came to me and poured out his soul, it is my obligation to take that confession with me to the grave. There are no exceptions, and those who do give up the details are often excommunicated from the church. You might imagine that there are instances where this proves to be a crisis of conscience for the pastor involved. I'm here to relate one of those instances to you. Most might think that by doing so, I am breaking the pastor penitent privilege, but there are certain loopholes which protect me. I'll explain them first before we get started. The confessionary will never be named, so do not ask in the comments who it might be. It would do you no good. The events have long passed and most parties involved are dead. Only God may be the judge now for their actions. Certain aspects of the account will require a specific time or place. Those portions of the story, I will be using public records that do not break the seal of confession. I joined the priesthood at the instance of my father, one himself for well over 30 years. There can be no higher calling for a man, he told me. Beaming with pride as I announced I had been appointed over a local youth ministry. I felt confident that I could make a difference helping troubled teens since I was one myself. But as soon as I finished my vows, the devil saw to it that I would be tested. <laughs> The morning in question was a quiet one. I had just finished cleaning the pews and unlocking the doors to our chapel when I saw a young man standing not far from me, shaking like a leaf. Are you all right? It's nearly 30 degrees outside. You could catch a death of cold, I called out to him. The boy didn't make a reply, and for a short moment, as I finished setting things up for the morning worship, I forgot about him. I have a fairly sophisticated security system in my congregation that gives us a chance to view the exterior straight from the safety of the church. When the system kicked on, I was quite surprised to see that the young man was still standing out there even though it had begun to sleet. Feeling my heart go out to him, I went across the chapel and grabbed a warm blanket and called out to him from the doorway again. Come in, my child, I urged him. At first, it seemed like he was going to ignore my offer, but something inside him convinced him to accept. Once inside, I guided him to the mess hall and remarked, You look like you haven't eaten in days. We have a surplus of food here we save for the homeless. What can I get you? The young man said nothing. Tugging at the edge of his blanket and shivering uncontrollably as I took a better look at his appearance, it was no stretch of the imagination to assume that this boy had likely been living on the street for years. It was still early and most of the cooks hadn't shown up for breakfast, so... I went to the pantry to grab something simple. As I was walking out of the storeroom, the boy surprised me, blocking my way. Do you believe in God, Father? He whispered. I smiled softly as I placed my hand on his right shoulder. I think I would be in the wrong profession if I did not believe my child. I tried to go around, but his feet were planted squarely on the ground, refusing to budge. Something was troubling this boy, and I felt obligated to continue our conversation. Have you lost your faith in our Lord? I asked. If God exists, why does evil exist? Is, is God evil? The boy asked as he grabbed my hand. He looked confused and heartbroken, as if someone had just taken away his whole world. Let's sit down and, and break bread. Maybe then I can help you find comfort for your soul? I suggested. Reluctantly, he agreed, as long as he had a firm hand in mine, and we walked together back to the table while I prepared the meal. Tell me what's troubling you. He fidgeted as he watched me and muttered, I think evil people outnumber good. That no one protects the good. No one cares, not even God. Has something happened in your life recently that has led to this crisis of faith? I asked. He bit his lip and I saw a twitch in his hands. I was right. 
He was hiding something. My child, you are in the house of God. You can lay your sins bare, I told him as I pushed a plate of food toward his outstretched hands. I'm not a bad person, he insisted as he started to scarf down the food. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you come to him in repentance, he can help you. I've learned over the years that there are certain ways that you can make a person talk to unburden whatever guilt they have. I can tell that the boy was going to tell me what was on his mind. It was just a matter of coaxing him to make him feel at ease. I, I haven't done anything wrong, the boy answered, getting more upset. Have you ever considered doing something bad, though? I countered, and that made him more uncomfortable. I didn't want him to completely clamp up when he was so close to saying what was on his mind, so I changed the topic and discussed the upcoming worship service we would have there. You can feel free to attend any of these, I said. I thought about hurting people before. Is that a sin? He blurted out. I had to choose my words carefully. I didn't want him to think that he couldn't open up further to me. I think that God understands we all have sinful inclinations. But it's when we act upon them that can be detrimental, I responded. How is something considered sin and something not? I paused, a bit perplexed by that. Even after all my years as a pastor, it wasn't exactly an easy thing to pin down. God gave us a conscience, my child. If it feels wrong, if you are consumed with guilt, then you know it is wrong, I told him. He mulled over that a moment before remarking, So, if you don't feel bad, it isn't a sin? I sighed. It's a bit more complicated than that, I'm afraid. How are we to decide what we should feel bad about or not? As I explained, our God-given conscience can guide us. He was leading towards some special purpose I could tell. It was simply a matter of having him say this aloud. I think God punishing the wicked is a sin, he whispered. Because you think it is not always a case of black and white, he nodded slowly. God works in mysterious ways. We cannot decide how he perceives sin. But if we punish those we consider wicked, it would be. So why does God get a free pass? The boy muttered in frustration. His ways are higher than ours, I told him. Then I want to be like God, knowing good and bad. He spat out and then looked at me squarely in the eye. Would it be a sin if I was trying to be like God? I think that if we follow in his footsteps, that's the closest to perfection we can ever come, I told him. The storm thundered loudly outside and the boy finished his meal before thanking me. You've been very kind, father, he said as he tossed his utensils away. There's no need to leave now, not in this weather, I advised him. Something told me I should keep him there, but the boy wasn't compelled to listen. His desire for vengeance and quest to right whatever personal wrong sounded like it had the potential to spill over and cause all kinds of problems if he acted on it. It must be hard being God, he whispered as he stood at the door. Then he left. I watched him go, concerned by the ominous message of his words, but knew little of what to do about them. Later that same week, I found in the paper a good reason for my concern. School shooting renders eight in critical condition at hospital. Three more dead, including the shooter. All the Hail Marys at my disposal felt hollow that day, because I was certain that by letting him unburden his soul, I had given that young boy the tools to feel like a god. I wonder then, if that made me the devil.